and welcome to First Chapter Friday, where I read the first chapter of a book you might want to finish. My name is Kathy, and I'm a librarian at the Palo Alto Children's Library, and I'm so glad you could join me today. The book for this week is Glitch by Laura Martin. And as always, let's read from the inside cover to see if it's interesting. Regan and Elliot are training to become glitchers, people who travel through time to stop others from altering history in order to change the future. The two have always been enemies, and it doesn't help that Regan has failed her practice simulation of Abraham Lincoln's assassination, again, while Elliot gloats. But when they find an illegal letter from Regan's future self, warning that they'll have to work together to prevent something terrible from happening, everything changes. Thrust together as a team, they set out to decipher the mysterious set of clues set from the future. When the unthinkable happens, they both realize that Regan's letter was all about and why her future self risked everything to send the message. Only Regan and Elliot can save everyone they love, and to do it, they'll need to break every rule they've ever been taught. Chapter 1, Regan. April 14, 1865. Gosh, I was sick of that date. And it wasn't just because that is when our 16th president was assassinated. Nope. I was sick of April 14, 1865 because I kept getting sent back to it for training purposes. Although training purposes was just code for, screwed up again, Regan, get it right this time. I materialized in the back row of Ford's Theater for the fifth time this year, just as the play, Our American Cousin, began. I always materialized into seat 10B when I did this particular practice simulation. It was supposed to contain Mrs. Margaret Ohana, but she'd gotten sick with the measles and hadn't been able to make it to the performance that night. Her change of plans had left a convenient place for time travelers, or glitchers as we're called now, to slip in and out of history on the infamous night when Abraham Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth. I'd see Booth momentarily, but I wasn't here to fix him. He would be allowed to murder our president without any interference from a glitcher like myself. Interfering with him is against the law. Interfering with him was why I was here on a training message in the first place. I opened my eyes and looked around. Because I'd been here countless times before, I barely noticed the immaculate and stately Ford's Theater, the theater goers around me wearing their best dresses and suits, or the smell of a generation who handled body oars by covering them up with heavy colognes and perfumes. Even though I'd done this a lot, I still couldn't stop my eyes from automatically going up to the balcony where Mr. and Mrs. Abraham Lincoln would be taking their seats any minute. They would arrive late to the theater tonight and would be safe until the intermission when their bodyguard would decide he'd rather go sit at a saloon and have a drink instead of protecting the president. There wasn't such a thing as the Secret Service yet, although, in a weird ironic twist, Abraham Lincoln would sign the document that would create the Secret Service right before he left for the theater tonight. With some reluctance, I tore my eyes away from the balcony. I had less than 10 minutes to find the butterfly and complete the mission. It was time to get to work. The last time I'd done this training mission, I'd immediately stood up and made my way to the lobby of the theater, sure that the butterfly would be in wait there to waylay Booth. Unfortunately, I'd thought wrong. I hated this simulation. It felt 10 kinds of wrong to allow something horrendous, like an assassination of arguably one of our greatest presidents. But it was all part of the job. It was why this particular simulation was so important to our training. We had to learn that what we thought about right and wrong didn't matter, at least not when it came to changing history. As a glitcher, it was my job to make sure things stayed exactly the way history books described without interference from a butterfly. The term butterfly had thrown me for a loop when I'd first heard it. It seemed too, I don't know, fluffy to describe a time-traveling criminal the same way you describe a really pretty bug. I mean, a time-traveling criminal is usually someone attempted to manipulate future with the full intention of screwing up the future, and there was nothing fluffy about that. But I learned quickly that the term butterfly did not come from the beautiful insects I saw landing on the flowers outside my window. 
Instead, it referred to the butterfly effect. In 1963, this guy named Edward Lawrence presented a theory to the New York Academy of Sciences that a butterfly could flap its wings and set molecules of air in motion, which would move other molecules of air, in turn moving more molecules of air, eventually capable of starting a hurricane on the other side of the planet. And everyone thought he was crazy for thinking something as small as a butterfly could start a snowball effect capable of wiping out whole cities. He was laughed at. He was called a fool. And then 30 years later, they realized he was right. So we called time traveling criminals butterflies, despite the fluffiness of the word, because they traveled back to the past to change something. They were the people who believed Hitler should have won World War II, that slavery should never have been abolished, or that women shouldn't have gotten the right to vote. That's where glitchers came in. I glanced down at my watch. It was the exact same one the woman three rows up and two over was wearing. Everything from my light blue dress with the ten crinolines underneath to the way my hair was curled and pinned up to the back of my head like a poodle was historically accurate, down to the last piece of lace trim. Of course, I wasn't historically accurate, since unchaperoned 12-year-olds weren't a common sight at Ford's Theater, but that didn't matter for a simulation. If I ever actually did this glitch for real, I'd be an adult with years of time traveling under my belt. I swallowed hard and ignored the fact that the thought made my stomach feel like I'd swallowed a bucket of live snakes. Shaking my head, I forced myself to focus. I looked just like anyone else at the theater. The problem was that the butterfly, wherever he or she was, did too. There was movement in the balcony to my right, and I glanced up to see the president and his wife taking their seats with their friends, Clara Harris and Major Henry Rathbone. Those friends were one of the reasons they were late. They couldn't get anyone else to come with them that night. Had Ulysses S. Grant's wife not been mad at Mrs. Lincoln, he would have been here instead of Rathbone, and Lincoln's wouldn't have been the only assassination. A movement to my right caught my eye, a slim man, probably 30 or so, had just stood up from his seat. I watched him leave, looking for a clue that would let me know he was the butterfly. Because if he wasn't, and I took him down, then I would cause even more damage to the future. It was one of the biggest rules of glitching. You could not, under any circumstances, accidentally become a butterfly. You had to be in the past, but not interfere or interact with it in even the tiniest, most inconsequential way. I had to make sure I touched no one, talked to no one, and didn't change the course of anyone's future by my actions. I was here to take down the butterfly. That was all. The man in question paused to talk to someone sitting in the aisle, and I immediately dismissed him. Butterflies never knew anyone from the time period they were messing with. Then I saw her. Two rows up on my right, a woman got up and made her way quickly down the aisle toward the exit. She was the butterfly. Don't ask me how, but I knew it instantly at a bone-deep level. But because I'd have to give a concrete reason for the identification in my debriefing, I took the extra half second to identify where she'd gone wrong. Like me, she wore an elaborate dress trimmed with lace, and her hair was twisted back into a knot at the base of her neck. I bit my lip, and nothing was out of place there. Then I saw it. In her ears were three tiny holes where earrings were supposed to be. No one in 1865 had multiple piercings. She was it. I carefully got up and made my way down the aisle, never taking my eyes off her as she slipped out the extra doors, exit doors. I had two options. Option one, I could follow her into the lobby and take the chance of her making a scene. Option two, I could intercept her somewhere out of the way before she made her move to take down Booth. Option one was easier, but I really didn't want to have to redo this simulation for the sixth time, so option two it was. I slipped out the side door and into one of the theater's many hallways. It felt narrow and dark with its thick velvet draperies and busy wallpaper. Suddenly, there was a noise to my left, and I saw a flash of blue skirts. Turning, I walked quickly in that direction. I'd have liked to run, but running wasn't something a lady did in a gigantic dress and ridiculous shoes that pinched. I had to blend in on the off chance that someone noticed me. 
Rounding the corner, I hurried up the narrow stairs toward the second floor. My lungs fought to expand inside the stupidly tight dress as I looked left and right down the empty hallway. To my left, I could see the curtain that hid the president from view. According to my watch, I was minutes away from John Wilkes Booth coming up the same staircase I'd just used, gun in hand. I felt my first flutter of panic in my chest. Where had she gone? Should I go back down to the theater and risk missing her? Or stay where I was and hope I saw Booth before she did? As I stood there, frozen, trying to decide which was the right answer, I heard a small sound directly behind me. It was the sound of someone unwrapping something covered in plastic. Plastic, a material that wouldn't be widely used until the 1960s. I whirled and saw the curtain behind me quiver just as the sound of booted feet on the stairs came from below. John Wilkes Booth was on his way up. Without stopping to think, I threw myself behind the curtain and wrapped my arm around the startled woman's neck. She let out a muffled gargle, and I saw the long, lethal-looking syringe in her hand. She stumbled sideways, throwing us out into the open, and I fought to keep my balance without losing my grip. Her eyes went wide as she realized that her opportunity to change history was about to be taken away. Her fingernails and teeth dug into the arm I had wrapped around her neck, but it didn't matter. I had her. The thump of Boo's boots was getting louder, and I knew I had mere seconds to get this done. If he came up the stairs and saw a woman and a 12-year-old girl brawling like a couple of ultimate fighters in big frilly dresses, it might be enough to deter him from his plan and forever change history. I reached for my belt with the arm that wasn't getting gnawed on and grabbed my chaos cuffs. It took a second or two of fumbling, but I got them on her wrist just as the handsome face of John Wilkes Booth made it up the stairs. A heartbeat later and we disappeared, leaving him free to commit one of the most heart-wrenching crimes in history. And that was chapter one. Subsequent chapters are in Regan's voice and sometimes in Elliot's voice, so you get different perspective on what's going on. And of course, the mystery is, why did Regan send herself a letter in the past? Hmm. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you come and join me again on another First Chapter Friday. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.